Welcome to Transformative Principle, where I help you stop putting out fires and start leading. I'm your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. As part of the Summer of AI series that we're doing here on Transformative Principle, I am sharing a few episodes from other podcasts on the B Podcast Network. I encourage you to listen to them and check them out and learn more about the shows and the great work that so many people on the B Podcast Network are doing. Here is one of those episodes. I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, Dr. Jones here with the latest episode of Seeing to Lead. And this week I talked to Mary Howard, author of the new book, Artificial Intelligence to Streamline Your Teacher Life, the chat GPT guide for educators. Now this conversation was really good because Mary and I come from the same place concerning helping teachers do the best they can at what they're trained to do. Being in front of students in the classroom, teaching in fact, When I asked Mary what her perfect classroom looked like, her first answer was a perfect classroom still has a teacher that's helping guide rich discussions through Socratic method and collaboration with AI helping streamline all that they do in the background. Mary comes from a place where technology is about amplifying teachers' ability to reach all students and often Teachers' reluctance to integrate technology doesn't come from a place of fear about that new technology, rather a place of this is just one more thing. So the more we help teachers realize that AI can impact their everyday practice, streamline it, and make their life, dare I say, a little easier, the more they're going to be excited to use it and engaged in the process of figuring out just how it fits. Mary shares so many tips, especially in her book, and strategies and techniques of how to use AI, especially chat GPT, for writing lesson plans, creating rubrics, and organizing projects that it is a must read. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. I sure did. So let's get right into it with Mary Howard on Scene to Lead. Hey, listeners. Are you looking to redesign or supplement PD in your school? Improving professional learning is an ongoing goal for so many of us. I'm happy to tell you about the AI Coach by Edina, a transformative tool that supports teacher learning in between your planned observations or PD days. Here's how it works. The virtual coach guides teachers to reflect on their teaching, set a goal, and create an action plan, all based on gathering classroom evidence. Better yet, The coaching cycles are customized to each teacher's needs. What I like best is the cycle of reflection and then practicing those new pieces so you can go back and reflect on them again. That's how improvement happens. Sound interesting? As a listener of this podcast, you can get a free trial for your teachers. Just mention that you heard about this on the B Podcast Network. Find out more about the AI Coach platform at edthena.com slash bpodcast. That's E-D-T-H-E-N-A dot com slash B-E podcast. We don't want tools getting blocked. You know, we want instruction to adapt and change as a result of the existence of the tool. You know, and so I don't think we can shy away from this or run away from this, nor should we. We as educators have to change the way we teach. If we're asking questions of students about content that can be Google, is it any different? If we're asking students to, you know, if they're asking something of chat GPT to get an answer to provide to their teachers, we are not asking the right questions as an educator. You know, we want students to think. We want to ask questions about them and their lives and their experiences and their opinions. That information can't be generated by a bot. You know, the, the human part of it is the student and it's the humans. Dr. 
Dr. Chris Jones here, and welcome to Seeing to Lead, a show designed to help leaders increase their ability to effectively support, engage, and empower their staff through intentional practices so that they create an environment where everyone reaches their greatest level of success. On Seeing to Lead, communication rules the day as we hear voices from both teachers and leaders in an effort to examine perspectives, highlight misunderstandings, and provide steps to ultimately bridge the gap between what teachers need and provide through thoughtful dialogue. This show is about amplifying voices, creating understanding, and providing information to help everyone continually improve. I want to personally thank you for taking the time. Now, let's get to getting better. Mary Howard is a nationally board certified teacher and teaches sixth grade ELA and science in Grand Island, New York. She has found success using digital tools that not only make learning fun for her students, but encourage critical thinking, collaboration, and create a lifelong passage for learning. See, I already messed that up. I'll take it again from the top. Mary Howard is a nationally board certified teacher and teaches sixth grade ELA and science in Grand Island, New York. She has found success using digital tools that not only make learning fun for her students, but encourage critical thinking, collaboration, and create a lifelong passion for learning. Whether the digital experience is related to science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or promotes literacy, Mary believes passionately in the potential that technology has for reaching and engaging all learners. In pursuit of this passion, Mary has spent the past 15 years presenting at dozens of technology conferences including NYSTANYS, STANY, I'm going to mess this acronym up, but I'm going to S-T-A-N-Y-S, and ISTE, STANYS, thank you, and ISTE, among others. She has become a globally recognized speaker on the topics of augmented reality and virtual reality and the next generation science standards and shares her strategies through her blog, YourSmarticles.com. She has published numerous educational technology articles and has provided webinars on virtual environments virtual reality, 3D design, QR codes, and digital engagement strategies. Mary's accolades include recognition as the 2018 International Society for Technology and Education's Virtual Pioneer of the Year and three Silver Presidential Volunteer Service Awards. She was a New York State Teacher of the Year, finalist for 2018 and 2020, and is a New York State Master Teacher. When Mary isn't elbows deep in her technology initiatives, she is a mother of three boys, and devotes her free time to refereeing youth hockey and volunteering within the hockey community. He's an avid runner, Adirondack 46er, and recently cycled across New York State on the Erie Canal. If all of this wasn't enough, Mary is now a newly published author with her recent release, two days ago actually, Artificial Intelligence to Streamline Your Teacher Life, the Chat GPT Guide for Educators. If you aren't excited about this interview, you are going to learn so much. I'm incredibly excited about it. I can't wait to hear from Mary. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. This is exciting. You know, a couple of things read out as I stood out as I was reading your blog, and especially thank you for help with that acronym. The mother of three boys. So my wife happens to be a boy mom as well with just all boys. So I'm sure that with refereeing youth hockey, you're you have no problem getting your hands dirty, so to speak, in different things. That's what it is with boys. Absolutely. They keep you moving, they keep you busy, and they make you excellent client managers, for sure. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, the other thing, and if we're going to stay on topic and fulfill that promise I told people about learning things, the other thing that stood out to me is you believe passionately in the potential that technology has for reaching all learners. Why technology? You know, we've heard about where you've been and what you do and all these accolades, but what is it about technology that stood out to you and got you so excited and engaged in it? It seems to be where my learners are coming from. And when you bring in the technology, and again, whether it's virtual real reality or augmented reality, it seems like that's the hook and that's the catch. And the rest kind of follows along. And it happened many years ago. I don't know if we even remember the Web 2.0 tool days. You know, those Web 2.0 tools came out and it was like, oh, you look, you can do this. And suddenly I saw I could flip my ELA classroom and I could truly make it exciting and engaging for the students, whether they were creating, you know, word walls or word webs and digital formats and, or sorting digital sorting cards or recording their own podcast. It just 
completely revolutionized the way I was teaching my class. And it, it changed the way the students were learning. They were suddenly just so excited to be there and so excited to be a part of learning. And that was my book. That's awesome. Because that is exciting, right? You, when you're standing in front of a classroom, it can turn into something that's difficult when you keep trying to do the same thing that students aren't engaging with, but it feels right for you because that's the way you're supposed to teach. And, uh, you know, I do air quotes with the supposed to teach. But once you turn that switch on for students and get them engaged, that's the exciting part of teaching, that light bulb moment when you see them buy into it. So how does that happen or how can we get people to understand that are maybe slow to technology and rightfully so because they're a little scared of it? How do we get them on that technology bandwagon, so to speak? I think... We do have to go back to the fact that teachers have really busy lives. And a lot of times, you know, that reluctance really isn't, I personally don't think it's a fear of technology. I think it's a fear of it being one more thing. You know, our lives are ridiculous. And, you know, one more thing, one more thing. And if we could get people to realize it's not one more thing that you need to do, I should say, if we could get teachers to realize it's not more thing, one more thing you have to do, in addition to the curriculum that you're trying to teach, it accentuates the curriculum that you're trying to teach. It enhances that curriculum. And it's not an add-on and it's not an extra thing. And I feel like that's where that reluctance comes in most of the time. You know, oh, that one more thing or that one more thing I have to learn. That tends to be what I see with people with respect to kind of grabbing a hold of the technology. Yeah, and that ties perfectly into what we want to spend the bulk of the time talking about here, right? That one more thing, I'm too busy. And you've just published this book that talks about streamlining things, which when I hear streamline, I think more efficient, less time used for a greater impact. And specifically, you mentioned chat GPT, which has caused quite a ruckus. In, it sure um, has. <laughs> it, <yeah. it's> very <laughs> so how can artificial intelligence help streamline or how can we help teachers understand that it isn't that one more thing? It's a tool that might be able to make their lives easier. And, and a part of that, too, is I think it's a tool to be feared in the classroom as well. You know, there, I think there is a lot of fear, you know, coming on with this new tool. And the perspective that I chose to take on this is related to the fact that we are, you know, we are crazy busy creatures. And, okay, here's AI. AI comes along. Chat GPT comes along. And the first minute you start to dabble with it, you're like, would you look at that? You know, it, it just it just aligned my lesson with standards, something that would have taken me a long period of time, you know, or, oh, would you look at that? It just wrote all of my students will be able to, all of my objectives, you know, so it's this idea that we're crazy busy, you know, I'd rather invest my time in making my classroom more engaging and not doing those, you know, things that a robot can do. And so it is kind of funny. Someone who's passionate about engaging students and passionate about integrating technology into the classroom actually writes a book about, no, we're actually going to not use this as much in the classroom. We're going to use it behind the scenes to help make us a better teacher in a different way. So it, it kind of almost doesn't line up when you really think about it, right? I love that you point that out about it. You know, I say often as a leader that the best place a student can be is in front of a teacher receiving instruction in front of a teacher because of that interaction. That's not to say that tools shouldn't be used or anything, but I love the fact that you're looking at how to streamline it for the teacher to almost free up the teacher to be more present with their students because that back end that takes so long that pulls them away from being able to do that is something that no longer has to be or to the extent that it has to be. Am I reading that right? You absolutely are. That, that is, is precisely the way I'm looking at it. Now, that is not to say that I'm against using chat T GPT in the classroom. I, you know, I think that's another conversation. And I do have a chapter of the book that talks about ways you can integrate and ways you can use it. Because again, I'm all about integrating technology. Yet for this book, I thought, no, you know, we've got these, we have teachers leaving the profession in droves. Y you know, you, every article we look at is showing the fact that they're burning out. You know, there's a different population of students we're working with right now with a different set of needs. Engagement is going to be all the more important right now. And just as you said, if I can have this tool, do that back end stuff for me, help me out, you know, where I need the lift, then I can devote myself to hopefully stay in the profession and help teachers stay in the profession so we can then start focusing on making them better, you know, improving OG and making people more engaging. 
not surviving, but thriving. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, all right. So we've danced around your book. And, you know, you even mentioned what one of the chapters is in your book. Talk, talk to us about your book. What was the impetus for this book? And how's it set up? What's it look like for teachers if they pick up this book? It starts with, you know, the what's it all about? You know, what is the hype? What is chat GPT? Where did it come from? You know, why is it desirable? Why is it a tool that we want to use? And it talks about how chat GPT was trained and kind of goes into a little bit of history of artificial intelligence and chat GPT. It doesn't dive crazy deep and it doesn't talk about, you know, sentient beings taking over the world. You know, we're not going that direction, but I think it's important just to have kind of have that background and have a working definition of artificial intelligence being something you know, designed to be useful in our lives. And it continues to talk about artificial intelligence as something that's actually been here. We may not have realized it. You know, many educators already take advantage of auto grading tools. They take advantage of adaptive learning tools in the classroom and those types of things. So it's thought to be feared. It's already here. It may not have been so prominent as it is right now, but it's here. And it's, as we both know, it's rapidly growing in, in all sorts of different dimensions. And so then it continues to break down use cases for the classroom. You know, like I'm a sixth grade teacher. And I always say, I'm just a sixth grade teacher. You know, here I am in the trenches, you know, just like hopefully the teachers that are reading the book and I dabbled with it. I'm like, well, would you look at this? It can write a permission slip or it can, you know, write a newsletter for families or it can help you pick the right word for a, an email. It can write a list plan for you, create stations, create task cards. So it goes on and on with all these use case examples for the teacher. And then, as I said at the end, it starts to talk about what we can do with it in the classroom with students. There's a little bit of a cautionary tale here and there throughout the book in a lot of different ways. We can't take chat GPT at face value. It's got its limitations. And there's a whole chapter that talks about the limitations and what we have to do to address those limitations. So there's a lot to it. Supporting your teachers and students seems to be a struggle. They just don't seem to be engaged. You wish they would take more responsibility for their learning and culture of the building, but they just don't seem to be empowered enough to do it. So my question is, have you checked out the book Seeing to Lead yet? It's all about creating a true educational experience where learning, growth, leadership, and community take center stage. Full of strategies and resources, Seeing to Lead is about attaining that goal by employing a model that supports, engages, and empowers all individuals to become leaders themselves. Pick up a copy today at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com. Remember, you don't become a leader and then decide you need to support and recognize others more than yourself. It is the moment you realize it's about supporting and recognizing others that you become a leader. Seeingtolead.com. I really like the way it sounds as it's set up where it's first an introduction and a realization almost that this is not something that click, oh, something happened and now we have all of this, that we've been using it right along and that you give then you give practical examples. Do you have some of those practical examples you could share with the listeners so that as they're thinking about this, they're like, well, I, I can think of this one or this one, but really it's only good for maybe this subject. You know, as teachers, we tend to say, well, that's good for science and math. It might not be good for humanities Yeah, and vice versa. So do you have some of those examples you could give to us? Sure. And, you know, I tried to be very mindful in the book of every single content area. A lot of it, you know, at times goes right back to my lens of, you know, ELA and science teacher. But every content area has a project at some point in time, you know, project-based learning. It's fabulous thing. And so one thing that is, I found was amazing, it was one of those jaw drop moments. I had a project that we were doing in class. I'm like, oh, I have to sit down and write a rubric. And if you've ever sat down and write a rubric, you just know, you know, when you're building those criteria for the rubric, just the wording, you know, words smithing each one of those different criteria in a rubric, you want a five point rubric and you want five categories and you got to write, you know, in that rubric, all those categories. I was like, chat GPT could do this for me. So I told it what I was grading, what I was looking for. And bam, it just produced this beautiful, you know, holistic rubric with five categories, broke it down exactly. Now, again, that cautionary table. Yes, I had to tweak it. I can't, 
you can't take it all at face value. You know, you have to look at it. But it right there was that kind of epiphany. Like, oh my goodness, this is going to save time. Not just for me, but for everybody. You know, so that I think that's probably the, one of the most powerful examples that I found. No, absolutely. And it's even the little things because I hopped on ChatGPT I, I was asked to do a letter of recommendation and it was a different type of letter of recommendation that I hadn't really had to approach before and not to get into too much detail about it, but I was stuck. And so I couldn't go to my file of all the letter of recommendations that I've written and adjust and move things around and do it that way. So I typed in to chat GPT, the focus and letter of recommendation and bang, there was enough that I could use ideas to shift around and something that would have taken me realistically an hour and a half, maybe took me 20 minutes. Isn't that crazy? And I thought to myself, this is, where have you been all my life? You know, I wanted to hug my computer. And then it lifted the load. Like that's the whole point. And it's funny you say it because I have that, a similar example in there. And, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the conversations around chat GPT are prompting strategies. You know, it, it does take practice and learning how to prompt it accurately. And there's a lot of, you know, different ways that you can prompt. And I've got a chapter in there devoted to my experiences of effective prompting strategies and ineffective prompting strategies, because that's a big part of it too. You know, you can ask it the question, but ask it in the wrong way. And you're like, ah, oh, that's not what I wanted. You know, but I love the recommendation example. That's a great one. That's, and so now you mentioned project-based learning. And it sounds like in the book, you've got, like I said before, a realization, here's where it comes from, a realization that is better around and the idea of how to use it and maybe where to use it. And now you're talking about the search language piece to help people use it even more. And you mentioned project-based learning. So the idea that I'm a teacher, I want to use this in, I want to use this in class for a project that my students are doing. What does something like that look like? So are you suggesting like that the students would kind of use it as a support tool for their project. Yeah, because I there's a section that talks about it. Now, again, I teach sixth grade. So my personal experience using chat GP with the students is limited because they're not of the right age. You know, there are privacy concerns and, you know, legitimate privacy concerns, you know, that, that move beyond just their ages. You know, it is collecting data and it is taking information from the users that use it. So it's something to always keep in mind. Now, if you're working with older students and, you know, we have release forms and we're you know, following the right channels, it can be used. And examples that I've seen people doing with project-based learning is kind of this, I always call it like a three-legged stool that's a little bit wobbly. You know, they can they can use it to help them find information. And yet, depending on the version of the bot that they're using, it doesn't have access to any information past 2021. Again, it depends on the version that they're using. You know, so they might not retrieve the most relevant and up-to-date information. And sometimes it makes things, you know, to fill in the gaps that it might have. And again, that's your wobbly stool. So it can't, it's not going to be, perfect in terms of replacing, you know, if you're looking for content or if student, our students are looking for content to support a project that they're working on. But it does, what I think it's really great with when you're working with students is for evaluative purposes. So if they're evaluating writing or they're comparing writing, the most compelling uses that I've seen in the classroom involve that, you know, it's a language bot, it produces language, you know, and if you're working with writers, I think it's phenomenal to have them evaluating the writing that it's producing on a certain topic and doing comparisons with that writing or grading the writing or even asking them, can you figure out, is this written by a bot or is it written by a human? And then you can start having conversations about voice or perspective or point of view in a piece of writing. So, you know, as much as English teachers are tend to be, you know, not really happy about the existence of the tool, you can flip it in, in a way, you know, to make it more beneficial. That's excellent. I, I was thinking as you were talking about the ability to do that and to compare writing and to pull up different pieces of writing. And even, isn't there a feature, I'm by no means an expert on chat GPT, but isn't there a feature where you can have it clean up an email you want to send? Or if you have an email? Yeah, it can clean, you know, it can clean it up. It can clean up the writing. My grammar experience with it is, it's not great. You know, I was asking it at one point in time, we were teaching pronouns and I was working with the students on pronouns and it was horrible. You know, the material it was producing with respect to pronouns 
was kind of like all over the place and it was not useful. And there, you know, there's two ways to look at it because, you know, you can have chat GPT generate information for you. And I have the section that talks about it generating information. But what you're suggesting is actually an entirely different section. And it's that evaluative part of things. You can put your information into it and then it can evaluate it and it can summarize or it can organize or it can, you know, if you're doing lists, working with lists, it can alphabetize and it can evaluate content, rewrite it, change the reading level on it, pull out important pieces of vocabulary. And that list, again, goes on and on, you know, in that chapter in the book, because there's just so much that it can do. Awesome. So with that in mind, and we talk about all the things that it can do and you've got you cover a lot in all the chapters of your book. Is there a point where it's too much, where it's relied on too much in education, either by teachers or students? It's a hard one. And I go back and forth on this, you know, because again, I'm a tech advocate and the tool is not going away. And tech advocates, we don't want tools getting blocked. You know, we want instruction to adapt and change as a result of the existence of the tool, you know? And so... You know, I don't think we can shy away from this or run away from this, nor should we as educators have to change the way we teach. If we're asking questions of students about content that can be Google, is it any different? If we're asking students to, you know, if they're asking something of chat GPT to get an answer to provide to their teachers, we are not asking the questions as an educator. You know, we want students to think. We want to ask questions about them and their lives and their experiences and their opinions Th- that information can't be generated by a bot. You know, the, the human part of it is the student and it's the human. So I don't think we should run from it. I think we need to adapt to it. So let me ask you this. If in your perfect world where people who are completely bought into chat GPT, leaders, teachers, students, or AI and utilizing AI, what does the perfect classroom look like? Or what does it look like for teachers, students, and leaders in your vision, so to speak? Perfect classroom, number one, still has a teacher in it. (laughs) And if if they're leaving the profession because they're overworked, they're not going to be there. Oh, in in some ways, it's kind of, that's where I'm starting from. You know, let's get the teachers to enjoy being where they are, enjoy what they're doing. And then the perfect classroom, of course, is, you know, is inquiry. It's tolerating ambiguity. You know, it's questioning. It's Socratic in nature. It involves discourse, conversation, discussion. You know, and yeah, chat B, GPT and AI is drifting somewhere there in the background of all of that, you know, but in, in the end, you know, those engaged students are just that. They're engaged students, regardless of the technology that exists in that place and time. Awesome. I'm going to put your memory to test a little bit here. Do you remember, I can't remember where it comes from, but it keeps ringing out in my head. There's an app for that. Remember that advertisement when it was becoming big? I can't remember who that was for or... I don't know if it was an Apple advertisement, but remember the saying, there's an app for that? You remember it. And I know I sound a little weird bringing this up, but, and like off topic, but thinking of your book, I almost feel like everything I ask, there's a chapter for that. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, That's 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 really funny. And I'm not doing it on purpose, but it's just, you know, what we put together a piece of work, you know, you try to everything, you know, like you want to cover all the bases. No, I I love that because what I'm sitting here telling people that they have to get, I already ordered mine. I'm waiting for it to come. Thank you. No, absolutely. I sit here and think to myself, and when I tell people to to pick up a copy of this book, one, because it's so timely, but two, now on top of that, it's so thorough that everything I ask about chat GPT, and I would dare say anything anybody else asks, there's a chapter for that. So if, yeah, we all, we all hope, but, but when they pick up the book, it sounds like it's been so well thought out and really explained in the book. So thank you for that. And thank you for offering that to the educational community in, in a time like this, especially what seems to be the part of the driving passion behind it. The idea of helping teachers um, gain some of their time back and not be so burnt out. Because without our teachers, there really is nothing else. Students don't get educated. And it's so important to keep teachers in the classroom in a good place so that they can do what they do best. And that's teach students. So thank you for that. 
Oh, my pleasure. You know, when you asked me what the perfect classroom is, and I had to do a little sidetrack because I'm a middle school teacher too, right? Like middle schoolers are weirdos. They're, they bring so much joy to my day. You know, like I last all day long when I'm not rolling my eyes, right? Yes. But And I think having that joy is so important, you know, and if you're burdened with all of this, you know, stretch, gnashing your teeth over, oh, I got to write down those standards or, oh, I got to prepare for that evaluation or, oh, I've got to answer this email or write this recommendation. You know, like we're in it for the kids, you know, not the other stuff, honestly, you know, so it's finding that joy. And I think that's so very important too. Perfect. Well, I could chat with you forever, but we're getting to the end of our time frame here for the podcast. And so I do ask every guest the same two questions. And so I'll throw these two, uh, two at you before we leave. If you were an educator, who, not what, would you be? Uninspired. It's one word. I would be an uninspired person. Those kiddos, you know, they bring me joy every day. And this is just, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but we were, I've been doing a crying scene with them all week long, actually for about a week and a half now. And I had this one student, her name's Leah. And she came up to me in between class. And she was like, okay, Mrs. Howard, I have some questions for you. And she put me through this massive interrogation about where I was when the crime was committed. She went on and on. And I was like, oh my goodness, I need to have them put me on trial. Like she inspired the next day's lesson. And, you know, that's just it. If I wasn't a teacher, I would, I think I would be uninspired because they are the reason for every choice I make and everything I do. I think I just heard a mic drop somewhere in the background when you said that answer. So we've talked about a lot. What's the most important piece of advice you would give to leaders to help them better support, engage, and empower those they serve? I think the name has to change. They're not leaders. They need to be cheerleaders. My boss is a cheerleader. He celebrates everyone's success, no matter you know how small it is. And that's the ultimate leader is a cheerleader. You know, it's so interesting that you said that. And Maybe this nuance is just natural or, or maybe it's meant to be that way. But when you said they need to celebrate every success, no matter how small, especially even the tiny ones, is that something that occurs regularly or something that is an experience of yours where the ones at monthly faculty meetings or the larger ones or the maybe weekly ones in front of a faculty don't cut it? And there's got to be somewhere between the individual maybe thank you notes or I notice you notes, different things like, or are those the types of things you're talking about? It's more of an authentic, you know, an authentic approachability. You know, you walk up and you tell a piece of news and there's this gasp and there's a hand five or, you know, jumping for jump, like just that authentic, you know, not, again, not that I'm going to write them a note because, you know, that's the right, I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's an approachability and it's this tangible feeling that you get from someone that is truly your cheerleader, you know, that's just so pleased and so proud when you're doing great things and wants to trumpet it to the world, not just, you know, write you a note, tuck it in your mailbox. I think it's more than that. It's a, it's a human touch and a human connection. Awesome. So, well, everybody that's listening to this, you heard it here first. Whenever you have a question about AI or chat GPT in in the classroom, or even for your use behind the scenes, there's a chapter for that. And you have to pick up Mary Howard's book. So I hope that works out. And You know, you've said a lot today. But as always, I think in this subject, technology in general, but especially this with AI, there's always going to be more questions or more clarifications needed. So if somebody wants to reach out and get in touch with you or follow up with you, what's the best way they can do that? I'm on all of the social media. So uh, on Twitter, it's at Mrs. Howard 118. And it's the classroom number. I know it sounds so boring. Like, oh my goodness, there's 118 Mrs. Howard. That's my classroom number. So Mrs. Howard 118, I am using your smarticles on Instagram, using underscore your underscore smarticles. And those are probably, you can DM me through those channels or Gmail, your smarticles at gmail.com is also an option. Awesome. Well, and um, your book is available Amazon, anywhere basically that you pick up books. So I can throw those links in there and I'll throw any special links in there that you want me to put in there. So those will all be in the show notes so people can easily get in touch with you or especially pick up a copy of your book. Awesome. Thank you for that. It's been so great talking to you. Yeah, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. I've 
got a lot of ideas floating around in my head and I can't wait to follow up with them. So thanks again for everything today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, that's a wrap, but not the end. Next step, be sure to take action on something you heard here today. Hey, thanks for listening to the Scene to Lead podcast. If you would like to connect for any reason, email me at drchrissj at gmail.com or catch me on Twitter at Dr. C.S. Jones. If you've gotten any value from the Scene to Lead podcast today, you can help me and other leaders create a world-class environment through a teacher-centric approach by subscribing to the show, leaving an honest rating and review, and sharing this episode on social media with your most valuable takeaway. Also, one last thing. Have you had a chance to pick up my latest five-star rated book yet? Grab your copy of Seeing to Lead anywhere you buy books or at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com, where you can learn more and continue to improve. Now go have a successful week.